All right, everyone. Our next speaker is Dr. Serena Vanis Iswaran from Texas Instruments. Dr. Serena Vanis Iswaran received his Bachelor of Engineering degree from India in 1998. He worked at Spec Electronics and ST Microelectronics India between 1998 and 2000. From 2000, he worked for Philips Semiconductors, where he designed analog circuits for mobile baseband and power management units. While working at Philips Semiconductors, he also received his international Master of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Twente, the Netherlands, on the design of NMOS LDOs. From 2006, he started his work at Texas Instruments Germany, and he received his Doctor of Engineering degree from the Friedrich Alexander University in Germany in 2017. His research focused on the fault tolerant design of smart power drivers and diagnostic circuits. Since September 2010, he is with Texas Instruments USA, where he is the design lead for several airbag squib driver ICs. He has also designed analog high voltage, negative voltage tolerant circuits for automotive car steering and braking ICs. He was elected as a senior member of IEEE in 2011, member group technical staff in 2014, and senior member of technical staff in 2019 at Texas Instruments. He has more than 18 patents, US and German, in the field of analog signal, analog mixed signal IC design. The title of his talk is Portable and Scalable High Voltage Circuits for Automotive Applications in Bi-CMOS Processes. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Serena Vanis Iswara. Thank you, Dina. Thanks, Christoph, for all your support. So I'm here to talk about uh, the portable and scalable high voltage circuits. once again. So this is my doctor thesis, PhD thesis. It's about uh, smart power drivers and uh, the topic for today is about portable and scalable high voltage circuits for uh, automotive applications and it's in a bi CMOS process. So I have my colleague Samir who helped me with the material and it's also with my professor uh, Dr. Weigel is in Germany. So with that I will get to the outline of the presentation today. So it's about the motivation for automotive ICs. Then I will give an intro into the smart power drivers with the case study being on the airbag squib driver, so which is needed to deploy the airbag in cars. And I will introduce about pin and design FMEA because that is the starting point for an automotive IC design. So it is where how the chip, uh, the specification of an IC and the architecture is the starting point for all those. Then the, I would like to talk about the high side and low side current sensing schemes. Then the biasing scheme, because when you have a power fit and a driver, you have to also take care of the biasing conditions of the whole chip. And in automotive, it's about diagnostics that's mainly running in the cars. So I want to give some intro about it. And what is the additional automotive requirements that a designer has today and the conclusion? Okay. So let me start with the motivation. So it will be about the automotive ICs. Then I will give you a little bit background about the automotive system on chips, the SOCs. The automotive system basis chip, it's not a big difference, but the, car, the jargon that's used today in the industry is SBCs. These are system basis chips. And uh, power semiconductors will play a key role in those particular uh, automotive ICs. I'll come to that. And uh, the key takeaway about the temperature, reliability, and the loads and what kind of circuits we see typically in the automotive environment. That is the key takeaway in the motivation side. Okay. Going to that, so the electronic control in automotive keeps increasing because we are trying to replace as many hydraulics as possible and getting them into the electronic mode, so for which the power semiconductors play a key role. What are the benefits we get is basically a longer life expectancy. 
and the cars are more connected now and there is a we lay the platform for more uh, safety that's uh, a new term called functional safety has been in the, in the cards for like last five years people are working towards making the cars more and more safe okay so an automotive system on chip basically relies on integrating as many circuits as possible so that means you're trying to put as many power semiconductor devices on a single substrate so the trend that we see today in the industry is going towards a larger integration of drivers. The motivation on the positive thing being the low cost because it results in lesser bill of materials and a smaller PCB size. There are cons to it, there are negative things. The disadvantages with this is when you put as many drivers as possible in the chip, the power dissipation increases. The, there could be a package limitation, so the number of pinouts and all those then you'll have a lot of crosstalk and noise between two different modules. So you'll have di drivers, you have diagnostics. When these two talk to each other, you will have a lot of noise going through each other. Or you put a sensor and a driver together in one chip, there is a lot of crosstalk. So now we have to, previously it was about a sensor chip and a driver chip. Now when you put together both the things, then pretty much you take a longer time for uh, validating those. And uh, a larger die means when, while manufacturing there can be more defects. And in automotive world, it's all about getting the quality to sub DPPM level. So ideally it should be zero. So defective parts per million is targeted to be zero, but we will achieve around one to two. That is pretty much uh, what every semiconductor supplier manages on a big SOC type of chip. So coming to the automotive system basis chip, SOCs and SBCs are not very different, but in the automotive world, the last three, four years, the term SBC is more prominent. It's called the system basis chip. So when you look into this side on the left, left hand side, like when the electronic content started to increase in the automotive world, pretty much every chip, every driver was a single chip. So you have like a power supply unit, that's a single chip, then a squib driver, Squib is basically deploying the airbag, so I will come to that in a minute. So each driver was their own IC. So you have like eight loops. So four loop will be one IC and this another eight loop, four loops will be managed by another IC and so on. So it was some, completely, it will be set of small chips. Then the heart of the control units are the microcontrollers. Then individual sensors, the controller area and the linear interconnect networks, the transceiver side of it and so on. So individual, that, that means limited drivers but then you'd have to have like 10 chips but now in the state of art is trying to bring more safety so that means you're trying to put more and more sensors more and more drivers when that happens most of the functions get integrated onto one chip and that is called a system basis chip and then you also have additional devices called the extension devices so the difference between a SBC and the extension is just the power supply and a few more sensors so the state of art increases the electronic content in the cars along with more and more integration and moves towards a more smaller PCB size. Okay, so how do we do this? What technology we need? When we look into the key components, the power ICs is really the power fets that come into play here. And these components, when we talk about the power dissipation, it's immense, it's really huge. So the height, the, when you take the VDS times ID, I have to calculate the power dissipation, especially in the squib driver that I'm going to talk about in the next slides. So you can see like there will be close to 68 to 70 watts of power that is dissipated. And uh, all power transistors typically use the uh, LDMOS, it's a laterally diffused metal oxide semiconductor, which we, uh, helps us to even achieve very low RDS zone and in a smaller area. So that's why LDMOS is the most preferred transistor. And then the requirements, if you see in the automotive world, the battery is typically 12 volt, but during load dump scenarios and all those, it can go up to 40 volts for several milliseconds. So even though it's not a DC, but milliseconds for an IC is still considered as a DC condition. So we need to survive those. And some of the applications where uh, the inductance dominates, inductance is dominating everywhere in the automotive because of the cables, but some applications like motor drivers, you will see uh, the voltage range can go even be, can go below ground up to minus 18 volt. So that could be due to the flyback, that could be due to the ground shift and so on. Um, if we slightly find a D drain extended NMOS, which is typically common in CMOS technologies, and if you can replace an LDMOS at the same area, then you can, 
it, the design becomes a bi CMOS totally. So we have two technologies today, a BCD and bi CMOS. So BCD means it uh, integrates the LD MOS with bipolar and CMOS. In the bi CMOS, you have truly a bipolar and a CMOS transistor. So that's basically the differentiator. And yet, typically, all the semiconductor manufacturers use DMOS for, uh, for the power stages. Okay. So let me give a little bit introduction into this LDMOS transistors. I mean, this is just a simple diagram, but it's not the true cross section. This is to give some info to the designers about the uh, diode that is built in with the uh, LDMOS transistors. So typically, uh, with LDMOS, the source and the bulk are totally uh, connected together. So you can isolate your source from the substrate. So this in creates an inherent body diode, a PN junction. And this PN junction is typically used as a blocking diode for some of the reverse protection scenarios that I'm going to talk about. So in LDMOS, is preferred the power transistor and its body diode that is inherently built in, built in is used in several scenarios for reverse protection. And uh, that in the technologies that, uh, that we see today in the industry, typically the VDS rating can be 12 volt for an LDMOS, it can go up to 85 or even 100 volts. And, but the gate source voltage is restricted to either 5 volt or 12 volt because of the oxide. So on the drain side, you have the mitigation with the, the low LDD structures, the lower dope drains to take care of the hard carriers. But on the gate to source junction, you are typically limited to 12 volts in older technologies and then the new technologies, you can withstand up to 5 volts. So that is one of the disadvantages, but we can still mitigate it and move on. On the other side, you also get in uh, some technologies offer the drain extended NMOS in the BCD as well, BCD technology too. So you have the same uh, drain source rating, the gate source doesn't change, but the drain extended NMOS offer you some kind of an isolation. So where you could isolate uh, the, um, the bulk of the NMOS transistors from the source through a, NBL, a buried layer. So this gives, this helps in designing circuits especially when your source or the drain pins go negative. So that is the advantage with uh, a kind of isolation transistor. I mean, you also have this in CMOS, the low voltage CMOS, but now that concept is also getting uh, pushed into the high voltage automotive designs. So you, you do have a possibility to isolate your junctions from the chip substrate of zero volts. And on the right hand side, you do see a couple of uh, NPN structures that, is, that are typically connected in this way. So base and collector shorted are a collector and emitter shorted. And these behave like Zener diodes. And these are used to protect the gate source junctions. So that is the advantage of a bipolar as well in a, in a, for automotive design because your gate to source junctions protection becomes very simple. All you need to do is drop this particular component in and it's taken care of. Okay. So coming to this temperature, reliability, and the loads, the first thing that we see commonly in automotive designs, especially in the power drivers, it's a high power dissipation. The junction temperature, when the such a FET is conducting a high power, it can rise up to 400 degrees. And I want to tell you that you don't need to worry about such high temperature rises. We'll, we'll see that in a minute, why we don't need to worry about it. And we have to design in such a way, like any other seam analog design, like not to violate the gate to source, drain to source, and substrate source to body body junctions. So that is called the electrical safe operating area. So once you take care of protecting the electrically the requirements, the gate to source junctions and drain to source junctions, so you are operating within uh, the electrical SOA of the FET. And if you make sure you don't overstress thermally the FET, that's that's called the thermal safe operating area, then you're also meeting the requirements for both thermal and electrical requirements. And all this kind of automotive devices, not they are still having a connection to the battery, but still they get sub-regulated to different voltage levels. Either they could see a boost converter or come down through a buck to a lower supply range. So you get multiple supply voltages for a driver. So from a power control unit, you will see that there are multiple supplies going into the automotive IC. And we have to make sure, because airbag is a safety device. You cannot deploy a bag, the airbag without a valid crash event. So we have to make sure that we are not turning on or turning off the FETs inadvertently. And coming to the load, 
So as I, the inductance range, just because of the cable, can go anywhere from 1 micro Henry up to 40. But there are some special cases like solenoid drivers uh, that are used today in pedestrian protection that can have an inductance up to 3 milli Henry. And when you do this, uh, the, when you do current regulation loops with this, the stability is critical. So we need to take care of that. And the diagnostic circuits, so all we need is they are the diagnostic, like a simple comparators to give the correct information, but also they should not give false information. That means the comparator, for example, should not trip in the wrong direction. So we will come to those features in a minute. Okay. So when you look into this overall topology for an automotive design, so they call this, you know, a kind of buck and word or power stage as the high side driver. And when you do it with the low side fit in a similar boost configuration, it's called a low side driver. So that's the big diff. I mean, in the jargon, in the automotive world, when you, instead of a buck and boost, you know, the, the designers come to know, typically say high side or a low side driver. It's nothing but a power stage, how it is configured. If you say it's a buck converter type, it is correlated to a high side driver. If it is on the uh, low boost converter mode, it's called a low side driver. What is special about this? So the inductance range is wide enough, as I told you, we have to go from even a micro, one micro Henry range all the way to a milli Henry. And uh, these have to withstand single fault. So in automotive world, because the cables are, you know, there are a lot of cables, there is always a probability of a single fault means a simple shot to ground on this output. We have to make sure that particular FET is protected for those conditions and that can happen several times. So we have to protect these particular output stages against faults, and that is one of the requirements in order model. Okay. So with this, let me move to the uh, script driver unit, and it's called a smart power driver. So the definition for a smart power driver typically refers to if you take a power stage, you have a gate driver, then the gate driver needs a kind of biasing. You know, you have to have some supplies, you have to have control signals. So the ability to operate a gate driver with a bi certain biasing scheme and the, the diagnostics that you put in, if you merge the power stage, it's biasing, it's diagnostics and how it is recorded through software. You know, there's a spy interface and every fault is recorded. So all the combination of this forms a smart power driver. That is how the trend is today. So with that, let me introduce a little bit on the airbag control unit, the ACU, the script driver unit and the power control unit. And then what requirements we get for these kind of devices from the man car manufacturers or the tier ones. Okay. So coming to an airbag control unit. So the airbag control unit contains the power con microcontroller, a power supply unit that runs out of the battery and all the gate drivers and sensors. So in a SBC type of device, so I already mentioned, so you have a power supply unit you have a few sensor interfaces integrated and the script driver, which is essentially the key to deploy the airbag during a valid crash. On top of that, you know, on high-end cars, they are adding more and more script deployment loops for knee protection, side curtain. So there are a lot of additional bags that come in. You cannot integrate everything onto one SBC. So they put it separate devices and these are called the extension devices. So pretty much this is the state of art for an airbag control unit today that integrates a power supply, a sensor for detecting a crash typically, and then once the crash is detected, the microcontroller commands the script driver to deploy the bag. So that's, that's how the system works today. I think it's freezing again, it's not working. Maybe I need to wait a minute. Okay. So on a squib driver unit, so typically squib driver is basically a current regulator. It contains a high side FET and a low side FET and the squib is connected in the middle. It's basically a pyro material that when you ignite with a certain amount of current for a certain amount of time, it ionizes the airbag and basically the, the pyro material gets ionized and it deploys the bag. So you have a high side FET that is going to regulate the current and provide it to the squib. And this is like a return path that goes into the low side driver. Typically, the low side driver operates in RDS on mode, but this is the high side. The high side driver is the one that's going to provide the current to regulate 
uh, you know, to, to deploy the airbag. So if you, if you see the gate driver aspect, you see that there is a high side uh, gate control and you have a low voltage, medium voltage and a high voltage supply. So the low voltage supply is mainly for the digital core and a few control signals. The medium voltage basically provides you with uh, the band gaps and all those. So that is used to generate the band gap voltage and all those. And the high voltage is basically driving the final stage, the gate driver, and then it basically outputs the current uh, out of the ZX pin. And from a diagnostic standpoint, so we keep monitoring the voltages that are needed to deploy this uh, airbag. So all the leakages that are present on the pins, and basically we monitor this resistance because if it is an open circuit, the current is not going to flow through. So we keep, so in the car, the diagnostics keeps checking all this. At the end of the day, if you really look into an automotive IC like airbag drivers, 75% of the pins will be 4 volt rated. So that is the challenge. So you have high voltage pins, uh, which is on the order of like, uh, if you have 100 pins, at least 75 pins are 4 volt capable. They have to be uh, withstanding 4 volts. That's the meaning. And there is a option to regulate uh, or to lower the power dissipation in the high side FET by just putting a NMOS transistor. So if you have 33 volts, then basically this voltage can be reduced to 25 to in order to just save the power dissipation, reduce the power dissipation within the IC. So the 33 volt is basically generated from a boost converter and that is subregulated to 25 volt for deployment. So, so that means you are talking about uh, a, a high voltage supply around 38 volt that goes into the driver. You have a 5 volt, 5 volt supply and the 1.8 or 3.3 depends on what the digital core can withstand. So this is how the NV IC environment is. Okay. So this is the power control unit. So all you have is a battery. So from the, that's a 12 volt battery. From a 12 volt battery, the boost converter generates about 32 or 38 volts. Then you can also, you have a buck converter which reduces the voltage to 6 to 7 volt as I told you, or 5 volts sometimes, which is basically needed for some sensors, the band gap and bias generators and all those, and a linear regulator to use to generate a 3.3 .3 or a 1.8 volt, and that is the supply for the digital core and the IO buffers. So uh, as I mentioned, the deployment voltage uh, can be at 33 volts or 25 volts, depends on uh, the requirement of the OEM, and then uh, on the, this, on the Basically, the power stages are designed based on that, and that is mainly needed for your thermal simulations. Okay. So, from a squib driver standpoint, you know, so at the end of the day, when a bag is getting deployed in a car, so the the bag, the squib driver has provided an output, which is typically 1.33 amps for two milliseconds, or you could have a current of 1.95 amps for 0.7 milliseconds. So these are the two configurations that are typically used for a squib driver or a pyro materials operating point, let's put it that way. So when you provide a certain energy in this term, like a regulated current, a constant current, so for this particular duration, it will ignite the airbag. So that's, that's the uh, requirement that uh, basically has to be sub, uh, met by a squib driver IC. That is in the powered state. So what, me what it means is this current can should be output or this energy should be provided by the driver only if you have all the three supplies correctly defined and a software command is sent saying that there is a, the microcontroller says okay now it is time to deploy the airbag so it, the software initiates the digital core and then it turns on the drivers so you have to have all the supplies and the command to basically enable the driver that's exactly what is expect what is expected from a squib driver unit However, in the last 10 years, we have seen some cases where you might not have enabled the boost converter or the buck converter, so the power to the whole IC is zero, but if one of the pins gets shorted to battery and then the current starts to flow through the high side, then you have to limit the current to 5 amp for 4 microseconds. Because you can see the peak current, just because the power fit is too big, it can simply couple through the gate and then the gate can rise up. And if you have a fault at the output, say a simple shot to ground, the current can just go through the squib and deploy the bag when it is not intended. So such things should be avoided completely. And for that, there is a standard called the AKLB standard, AKLB 16. 
and uh, the requirement is we have to limit the peak current to 5 amps for 4 microseconds and that's called the no fire spec. So the one that you see here on the left that's called the all fire spec and the one that you see on the right with such a peak current limitation or a surge current control and such a requirement is called the uh, no fire spec. So the standard, the airbag standards they define it clearly so all fire and no fire spec to make sure all fire spec happens only when a proper crash is predicted and the no fire spec we have to meet it to make sure there is, there is no inadvertent deployment. So when you have an ESD event or when you're driving on a highway then there is a discharge you should not deploy the airbag. So this is the safety requirement and this is the electrical specification for such a requirement. So finally, this is how the specification will turn out. So high side fed is really the one that dominates. It, it is the one that provides you the current. So you need to have plus minus 10% accuracy of 1.35 plus minus 10%. Try to meet for a wide range of inductive loads. And the low side typically operates as a resistor, but in case there is a short to battery. So there should be a current limit to protect the low side driver. And that current is in the order of three amps. And I told about the surge current limitation, which should be 5 amps for 4 microseconds. And these are all some of the Quizen current and the diagnostic requirements. And this is the output of a diagnostic circuit that goes to the microcontroller. And that needs to be limited to 5.4 volts because of the low voltage micros. And the deployment voltage can be like 25 volt to 30 volt, 35 volt. And the leakage current we specify out of on the FEDs is basically around 1 microamp in the whole range of 0 to 35 volts. Okay. So this is the first squib driver from TI. So this was released in 2010. So that was using a 0.35 micron technology. And the first device we released was the four channel airbag driver. Okay. With this, let me, let me go to the uh, failure mode effect analysis. This is pin FMEA and design FMEA. So where do designers get the information to start the design? So basically it doesn't co come out all of a sudden, but for an IC, so the system engineers, like Samir and uh, even the OEMs, they try to give a list of, give the pin out for the device. This is how they want the device to be assembled on the PCB. And based on that, so we do the pin FMEA. FMEA stands for failure mode effect analysis. So if there is a failure, how we are going to detect and how we are going to mitigate the risk due to a failure. That's exactly the background behind the PIN FMEA. And from moving from PIN FMEA, we go to the design FMEA because there are certain things have to be in, uh, incorporated in the design. And with that, I will also introduce a little bit onto the current sensing schemes. Okay. So FMEA and the automotive IC designs go hand in hand. Okay. So basically we are trying to address the, because a single point fault can never be ignored in automotive design. So there is a high chance of having a single fault on a pin in a car. So the design needs to handle, address this by design. So, so the occurrence you can see that's why, you know, from a probability standpoint, the occurrence is seven. So that means the chances of shots during PCB manufacturing level is high. So whether they're wiring the, you know, the nets in the car or what during manufacturing, there can be a shot. So we need to be able to detect it. So that is why the detection is high. Now chances of detecting should be very high and the occurrence of the fault is also very high. So this is the numbers. Typically when you do a pin FMEA, it is recorded. And for example, this is the template. So you take a regulator, let's, so I'm giving a simple example with the five volt regulator. So you do three kinds of, or four kinds of combinations. So if you have a pin open, so there is no output of the regulator because a missing bond wire is a good example. So if you have a short to ground on a regulator output, I mean, if you don't have a protection, it's going to burn a lot of power. So you need to limit the current that flows through the regulator when there is a short to ground. Similarly, there can be a short to battery. So in case your supply is not battery, but a lower supply and the output goes higher than the input, you still need to protect your circuit from getting damaged and the short to neighboring pin. So a pin sees four combinations, short to, short to ground, short to battery, short to the neighboring pin, and if it is an open pin. So all these combinations have to be recorded and based on that, you see what is critical for your design. So when you look into these cases, so a short to ground or a short to battery, is a high risk because you have a high power dissipation. So you can easily damage the FET if there is no protection. 
So that's why current sensing comes in because we have to put a current limit for both the scenarios. Okay. So how how do we go from pin FMEA to design FMEA? So that is the next step. So we saw that when you have a short to ground, for example. So if this pin is shorted to ground on a regulator, so basically nobody is going to limit the current unless the current limit circuit is added. So that is the current limitation. First step is current limitation. Then. Now, in design FMEA, people think about, you know, there's always questions, what happens if the current limit fails? Or like, or is there's a current limit and you're not detecting it after like, say, 10 milliseconds or one second. So till that time, you're going to limit, it will be limited, but then there is a lot of power that's going to get dissipated due to the current limitation. Then people thought, okay, we need a backup plan. If there is a current limit, let's go detect it and then turn it off. So that's why they started to introduce a overcurrent detection concept. So I have a current limit, let the current flow, but let, let's, flow, let's limit the duration of the current flow and that's where the overcurrent detection comes in. Okay, so that means if your load, if the current through this FET, uh, you sense the current and if this current exceeds a certain threshold, you go and turn off the regulator. So that is the backup plan. Okay, so now then again, people started to think, okay, I have a threshold, but what my, if, what, my, what if my load is slightly lower than the threshold? So then they say, okay, oh, then you also have a problem where you may not be able to turn off the regulator. So that's again still introducing some kind of a risk. Let's go for one more backup plan and that's the thermal protection. So you see, in, if you take a con consumer device or a conventional LDO, there are, there, it might have a current limit, but it may not have a overcurrent detector or a thermal protection. But nowadays they're trying to integrate, but Maybe a, a few years ago, this was not the case. So in automotive design, it's always important to have an overcurrent detector and a thermal protection just as backup plans because there are a variety of cases where one of those can be missed and you could still land up in a risk, high risk scenario. And that is why you see from, from a simple regulator, you know, you can see from a simple uh, NMOS power stage, the design gets a little bit more trickier. So you have basically a current sense you know, which is going to limit the current. So then you have an overcurrent detector to limit the duration of the current flow. And even if that fails, and basically you have a thermal protection to eventually turn off the regulator. So this is how basically the design starts to develop in automotive devices. And let's say, here I put VBAT, but let's say you have a situation where the supply for the VDD5 regulator is from a six volt regulator. And then you get a chance, because of the cables that are running all, uh, everywhere in the car, if VDD5 gets shorted to a voltage higher than the input, then basically the current will flow through the body diode and you will damage the fit. So to do that, what you do is, a simple way to do that is to put a blocking diode. So the current will try to flow, but it cannot go and charge the battery again or the supply. So that is the way to put the reverse protection. You can make it a little bit more complicated, but here for the presentation, I left it with a blocking diode. And that is typically the conventional approach first. So uh, here, again, you will see that most of the uh, designers always use a resistor across the power fed to keep the VGS close to the VT or lower than the VT, so that you don't need to turn on during power up conditions. I will, I will show that in a minute in the, while talking about the high side. and. Uh, and, uh, you know, so all the junctions need to be protected. So basically you have a NPN transistor. I mean, this should be connected to the output. So, so pretty much you have a current sense and also a gate to source protection. So eventually you can see from a very simple design out of an NMOS power stage, it gets a little bit more complicated for safety. So that's how the design evolves in automotive, how the pin FMEA and design FMEA aid the design for safety. So with this, I will also introduce the types of current sensing techniques, which you will also find in several textbooks. And this is no way different for automotive. So you have a power fit. You can sense the current by putting a resistor at the source. You can put a resistor at the drain. You could simply sense the VDS. You could put a sense fit, either tie the drains together or have the sources together. So these are five, three to four the different schemes that you can use to sense the current. So if you have a sense resistor on the source side, one disadvantage we have been seeing consistently is when the uh, pin goes negative, you know, it messes up, it injects a lot of substrate currents, and then you can mess up your current sense completely. 
So for negative voltage requirements, we started to put the drains, uh, the resistor in the drain side. But then uh, you have a certain gain in this loop. This is a source follower type approach. Here you have a certain GM times R sense gain. So this is, in a, I mean, this protects you from substrate currents. But then stabilizing the loop with for inductive loads may not be as straightforward. Or it could be a little bit more uh, with the bigger ca capacitors or resistors might be needed. So coming to this power fit, uh, based VDS based sensing, you could also do that. You can also achieve higher current limits when compared to your resistor based sensing because the resistor area gets limited. Now, that is the limiting factor for a resistor based current sensing. But you can use a sense fit based approach for a, or a RD, VDS based approach for the higher current limits. But everything has a mismatch. One is the resistance varies so much, and the other scenarios the uh, VT mismatch of the LDMOS transistors is quite high. So you need to mitigate the risks accordingly. Okay. So, so I will start with putting the R sense to uh, you know, explain a little bit on the current sensing. So these are all textbook circuits. So you have R sense. So basically a current flows through this resistor. You sense the voltage and basically you are outputting an equivalent of the current. So you are sensing the load current first and utilizing that information. So this could be one way, you could also connect it to ground and you can see how the output voltage can now track the load current. And if you do the limitation, meaning that you come back and control the gate voltage of this power fit, so then you're limiting the current, which is again set by the reference on the sense resistors. So you could expand the sensing to a limiting, uh, you know, by putting additional loops. That's, that's the background. And what kind of circuits we commonly use these are basically uh, minimum current, maximum and minimum current selectors. So basically, you saw all op amps, right? So basically, if you go back to the previous slide, so you're seeing everywhere an amplifying stage or a differential amplifier. So when I come back here, I'm showing a differential. This is the textbook voltage differential. This is current differential. Based on the load, the inductive load, we will decide where, whether to use this or use this particular topology. Then there are uh, you know, these are conventional voltage and current limiters. So when you have 40 volt and you want to limit your output, all you do is typically limit the gate voltage of the FET, N MOSFET, and you're going to provide V bias minus one VT. That's as V out. So that's basically a very textbook based approach is what we will start to use with. And whenever you want to limit your current, all you can do is you have a current mirror. And if it is shorted to ground, the current is set by MP2. Uh, which is basically derived from I bias. So these are very traditional approaches. Everywhere you will see people using current mirrors, voltage limiters, and so on. And maximum and minimum current selectors. Minimum current selector you typically use in several class AB amplifiers. So there is a maximum current selector can, can be, be used in more signal processing, but we have also started to use in automotive when it comes to some of the biasing schemes. So this gives you the minimum of the two currents and this circuit provides you the maximum of the two currents. Okay. So we have seen current sense, we have seen what kind of basic elements we need to use to build up circuits. With that, let me move to the high side current sense. Because the high side is the most critical one because it regulates the current to deploy the airbag. So I will introduce the current regulation concept. Then I will take you to flow therm simulations, which are thermal simulators to give us some idea on what kind of temperature rise we will see during these kind of events. Then there are isothermal plots. Then the layout strategy, how do you use this? The freewheeling path that I told you and the self-heating. Okay, right. So we again, the squib is nothing but a current regulator. So a squib driver, when it does the main function to deploy the airbag, is just regulating your output current. So this current has to be regulated. So when there's a load change, you want to regulate the current to either 1.33 amp amps or two amps. So when you look into this reference current, it's a simple current mirror circuit. And then the ratio of the two resistors is what is going to set your regulated current. So it's a very simple textbook circuit. But if you look into the load, you have a kind of RLC network because this is set by the wiring inductance. This is the resistance of the pyro material, and you have typically have capacitors for ESD reasons, which is, which is also going to help in stability a little bit. And if you look into 
it doesn't matter whether, whether you can deploy from a 25 volt source or a 35 volt source. So let's say you have the worst case scenario is basically when this voltage is at zero and this is at 35 volt or 34 volt. If you use two ohms, okay, you modulate it accordingly. But you can see the power dissipation, two amps, 35 volt across the high side, you get 70 watts of power for 0.75 milliseconds. If you use the other scenario, 1.33, Let's roughly put 1.4 calculations. It's like 49 watts for 2.1 milliseconds. So you're going to have around a 48 millijoule of energy and this is our 98 millijoule of energy during the deployment event. And the question is whether we need to be scared of it. The answer is no. Okay. So that is where the thermal simulators come into picture. So you start the design. For designers, they first do this is through SPICE. They, they have RDS on spec. It can be 300 milliohm, it can be 500 milliohm. So you size up the FET for the particular resistance and then you feed the information regarding power dissipation and the area of the FET into the thermal simulator to calculate the junction rise in the high side FET, the temperature rise. Then basically every technology defines something called as a critical temperature, t -crit. So if, if your junction temperature rise is within the critical temperature, then pretty much you are operating within your thermal safe operating area. If it is not, then you have to go and increase your W over L and then recalculate. And then basically make sure that your FET is still with, within the thermal SOA limits. So for example, in the quad channel driver that we have done, so we this is the center of the die which is used for monitoring and we monitor the temperature rise across the high side FET you know, around this area. And we do the case, we also deploy, in the worst case is basically if all the loops get deployed simultaneously. So then you're going, to, every FET is going to dissipate, let's say 98 watt of power for that particular duration. That is really the worst case. So you take that worst case situation, feed that into the thermal simulator, and the thermal simulator gives you a result like this. So all the junctions, you see this is somewhere at the center of the FET. The, volt, the temperature rise can be as high as 435 degrees. So this is for both the scenarios we have to do. And we use an ambient of 135. Why, why do we use an ambient of 135? The, the specified ambient temperature in the application is only 95 degrees. But when your buck converter and the diagnostics already keep running in the car and then you get a deployment, the, the junction already shifts from you know ambient all the way to 135 because the power supplies, diagnostics are already running and they heat up the chip. So the junction goes at 135. So from ambient, you already create a junction rise of 40 degrees. And on top of that 40 degrees, you are putting your deployment event, and then you are estimating what is the worst case rise in the temperature during deployment. So the other way to look into this figures is by looking into something called as the isothermal plots. So you can see here, this is all loops deployed simultaneously. So this is the two amp scenario. The right side is 1.4 amp. So the junction temperature reaches like 460 degrees, worst case here, 470. There is one problem with this because the SPICE models were basically restricted to 200 degrees. 10 years ago, they were not even modeled after 150. So now we have to find a way to basically make sure that the FETs can still work, your gate driver can still work even if the temperature rises to 460 degrees. Okay, what can we do to explore this, uh, you know, area that is not simulatable? So come up with a strategy. So we know that we have models still 200 degrees today. So, so your basic circuits, the IRF generator and the OTA, which is really the key for the regular current regulation, you place them at a temperature range of 200 degrees. So that means if I go back, so this is basically my area that goes up to 190 to 200. So all my reference circuits will be here and the OTA will be here. And the other in the gray area, that means in the intermediate location, we will try to place the source follower circuit. So again, so the, the, the circuits that are very critical to us, basically put them in the known simulation range and that is not simulatable. So when you're going towards the 300 to 400 degree mark, so then you place some of the circuits and you try to make sure 
the current basically mf and then ig is the current of a output of a source follower you try to over design the mf transistor it's not a it's not a big area it's a very small transistor but try to make sure it can do to it it can drive twice the current so that you can because as the temperature rises you are going to see more and more leakage so better try to design the m transistor mf so that it can overdrive your current you know it can really support 2x the current load so this if they do this then basically we can make sure we can really achieve a, even a first pass silicon it can work even if you're you are limited by your models up to 200 degrees okay so then we after you know developing the basic topology for the high side we go and revisit our dfmea and then trying to figure out what can go wrong so as i told you typically you know every transistor needs a protection you could use a forward come a reverse junction forward come reverse junction to protect it but in the unknown area of temperature where the models are not available all forward diodes can be leaky so even especially when you are having your ota biased with 10 micrograms or 5 micrograms of current for stability you don't want to have a forward diode that can steal away 1 microamp of your current at such high temperatures so in the, that's the risk so design fmea go back and analyze what if my diode d2 or d4 leaks okay so so you don't want to you don't want those diodes in the forward mode simply use only d1 and d3 okay so that's fine so then how how, how does it turn out to be how i'll show in the next slide so this is how the floor plan turned out so you have the high side fit where the temperature can rise up to 400 degrees so my ota and uh, the irf generator are placed somewhere between 200 and 175 degrees so here is the metal resistor that's on top because that is a metal 3 resistor so you have a lot of top metals from the poly layer so that is not a big source of the temperature or the temperature rise in the fit and the rest of the source follower circuits are here so here you can see here they are seeing about 250 to 300 degrees so when the moment you ready disconnect the diode or short out the diode d2 and d4 you typically have some kind of a leakage spec uh, in the off state of the fit typically customers always like nano ohms of leakage but in this scenario you can go and trade off with 10 microamp of leakage at 5 volts because when you raise the spin to a high, like 5 volts the leakage in this path you know it has to go and the output is pulled to zero all you want to do is 10 microamp of a leakage so that is much better trade off than fighting with nano amps and putting forward diodes at 5 volts So this is how the structure turned out. So we have a very simple textbook based OTA. Here is the source follower, and this is the stability loop I will show you. And here is the power stage. And instead of IG, the current outload in a basically we used a resistor. So automotive designers, if you look, they typically prefer resistors than current sources in many of the stages like this. And the reason for it is, especially when you power up the device, you really want to keep the VT. ask i mean the, i mean the vgs to be less than the vt and if you put a current source it's a high impedance so it could eventually keep the gate and source go above the vt but if you put a resistor in the order of 100k it will always ensure that you are your vt doesn't you know your vgs doesn't go above the vt and the fed doesn't start to turn on and that is why designers typically use resistors instead of current sources in source followers so that is one particular kind of differentiator between a consumer and automotive so automotive if you see any power fit they will have a resistor between the gate and source that's always a pretty standard experience from the designers not to turn off turn on the power fit inadvertently but keep it off and keep it safe so when coming to the inductive loads you see if you take a buck converter you put an external short key diode for free wheeling or you have synchronous fits to provide the free wheeling current when the high side turns off but in gate drivers like this especially for cost we cannot put a short key diode externally so we need to find a way to send out to provide the free wheeling current and for that what we typically do is you know provide the current through the fed because this voltage goes negative and then when you go negative you know there are always some diodes to the substrate they get clamped to minus 0.7 so you get a positive vgs and provide the free wheeling current and that is mostly the safest approach uh, we have seen uh, and this is little new so not many people do this way 
so we try to provide the positive vgs for the current and the free wheeling current goes out of the high side fed during the off off you know during the off phase and this is very now people have started to go this route so ti i mean we tried out tried it out it worked and we started to use this design more in several uh, applications these days okay okay so this is a small signal analysis analysis so you can simply see that uh, the ota has a single high, high impedance node and you get the second pole from the in the output stage so you have two poles and you need to compensate you can simply introduce a zero with a resistor and the stability is achieved so this is basically a textbook based compensation that we have found out okay you can support 1 micro henry to 3 milli henry inductances based on this approach so you don't need anything fancy so here is how the plots look like so you have a combination of 1 micro henry with 8 uh, ohms that is a overdamped scenario and if you take 1 ohm resistance with a 100 micro henry load or even 3 milli henry it becomes a completely underdamped and in all the cases you can make it stable so let me give a little bit more introduction to self heating so i told you that we have been using metal resistors so the metal resistors instantaneously heat up the moment the amps of current go into it and we were trying to target to 2 amps but you can see the current came down to 1.75 after 4 microseconds and this is due to self heating by joule's law so we have to compensate for the self heating because in simulation you will see a constant current but the silicon shows a decreasing current after a few microseconds and to compensate for it we increase the reference current so this is just to make sure that you can be on target and you will always see a behavior where you can see the silicon result you know the current goes up and then comes back pretty clean so this is the high temperature at 35 volts so you are talking about like 400 degrees of uh, junction temperature and you can still see a more cleaner uh, current regulation for uh, uh, you know such a loads such high inductive loads so let me try to speed up so this is already 352 okay so let me introduce to the short to ground and short to battery conditions so so if you have a single loop single stage so this node can be shorted to battery and this node can be shorted to ground but having the same double fault on a same loop is completely you know that's a very very low probability but you have a single fault that's a high probability but you have two faults on the same loop it's a low probability but you have multiple drivers what can happen is a short to battery on this node and you can have a short to ground on this node and if it is a very fast spike what happens is you can see the body diode can go and produce a spike on the high side and the current can start to flow through the uh, to ground through the squib and deploy the bag and that is why so when you don't take precaution in this scenario so when you don't have a certain mechanism to discharge the current to discharge the cap volt the gate capacitors so you can see that you know this is what we need in the powered state but when you go into the unpowered state and you have a very fast short to battery so you can see a 4 amp of current and it keeps staying there for a very very long time so basically for the squib it doesn't know whether it is a valid deployment current or it is a you know it's an inadvertent deployment but it will deploy the bag anyway so that is where the 5 amp 4 microsecond spec comes in to keep the vgs as low as possible so in order to achieve that we can do a few tricks so basically you take the same stage so sense the spike on the through a capacitive feed forward and then you can basically keep the uh, short the so typically rgs make sure you are already less than vt but to speed up within discharge within 4 microseconds all you do is a feed forward uh, capacitive sense and then you are basically shunting this resistor with the pmos and it pulls the gate low so that you are you know you are a discharge the peak current you see a peak current and it discharges very quickly so this is that means the gate voltage goes up and then it keeps discharging you know it comes below vt very quickly and this is basically to make sure you are always meeting the 5 amp 4 microsecond pulse in the in the un unpowered state right so we talked about the short to battery scenario so we talk about let's say short to ground scenario in some cases what have happened is 
So you see, typically Zx sees a low ohmic path, right? So you have the current comes out, it goes into the squib. But what if there is a mechanical connection that is not done well? So it looks like an open circuit and if you have a sudden shot to ground, you have a very high peak current. Because see, if, if it is open, the FED turns on completely and the voltage goes up to 22 volts and you immediately shot it to ground so the gate needs some time to react. So in the meantime, the peak current can go as high as 14-15 amps and if it is not uh, taken, I mean if it, if it is too high of a peak current, you can blow up the shunt resistor. So that is what you see here. With 22 volt, everything looks good. But the moment we get into uh, a very high voltage of 30 volt, so everything is burnt. So you see a short circuit on the high side fit and we have to take protection to this to address this. Again, so there are two types of solutions. One is we limit the voltage to 22 volt and this is where the third switch comes in, the what I talked about before. But if some cases, if you are not able to use the third switch or the safing fit outside, basically you have to have a comparator that again uses the same discharge path and reduces the current very quickly to the regulation level. So this is this has evolved over years. You know, it's not that everybody were aware of this 10 years ago, but people have seen failures and designers have started to put additional mitigation steps in order to make the device very safe. Okay. With that, I'll go to the low side. So let me speed up a little bit here. So the low side is basically targeting a 3 amps of current during short to battery. So instead of a sense resistor, because this, we cannot make the resistor wide enough to handle the 3 amps, so we have to go with the uh, sense fed based approach and basically first is you need to sense the current accurately, so you have a kind of VDS equalizer and then comes the main amplifier to regulate the current. But if you look into the transfer function, because now the inductor goes on the drain side of the low side driver, so it, at high frequencies you get a gain. So the transfer function is already of the second order, is already S squared. So how do you make it stable? So the trick we have used is basically let's use, utilize the gate to source capacitance of the FET and effectively compensate it with that. This avoids additional capacitors, especially you need 40 volt capacitors to stabilize. So you can get rid of all those and make the compensation capacitorless. You are using only the CGS of the FET to compensate it. So this is one loop and this is another loop. So the first loop is a very simple current differential amplifier and this is where the current differential amplifiers come in because it, it, these are, you know, pretty much you can make them sta stable very easily. And here this is also a current based approach. So you can see a current input stage that comes through and then basically you are regulating the gate voltage of the comparator, of the power fit. And these components are basically for freewheeling. So at the time when the low side driver turns off, you are going to have a peaking in the drain voltage because of the inductive flyback. And basically this is going to short, so the voltage goes up, the FET, uh, the, the clamps break down and pr pretty much they raise the gate voltage and the FET takes the current. So the summary is basically in these kind of drivers, you have to always provide the freewheeling path through the FET. If it is high side, you provide by positive VGS by clamping the gate negative. In the positive, in the low side driver, you bring the gate up along with the drain after the clamp breaks down and make the FED take the current. So that's how exactly it works. So this is all a set of simulation results. And you can see, and this is again, the same discharge concept is used because you can also have a high sh short to battery on the low side. So basically you can have a short to battery here. If the current goes through the squib, without, that, that doesn't have a passive discharge or active discharge, you are going to deploy the airbag and eventually we can use the same trick that we used on the high side to bring down the peak current very quickly to less than five, from five, five amp is the peak current. You can bring it down within four microseconds to less than 100 milliamp and provide and avoid the deployment of the airbag when it is not needed. So the same tricks apply for the high side and low side. Okay. So again, this is a view of the results. So this is how the regulation works for different inductive loads and resistors. And here is the, this is the shot to battery, 35 volt in 300 nanoseconds. And the circuit works, you can see the peak current goes up and gets limited immediately by the feed forward circuit. So 
so these kind of tricks can be applied to make sure the circuit is safe and uh, you know ensures you deploy the bag when it is needed but you don't deploy when it is uh, not needed so that's that's the mechanism we use here okay so we have covered the power stages so let me quickly go through some of the main problems we have during biasing so the see the circuit needs three supplies the high voltage low voltage and the medium voltage so all these supplies don't arrive at the same time to the driver so that is the fundamental problem today so all these chips don't get the supply simultaneously so which means when you use the cross coupled level shifters so you see this voltage is available but if they if these two are not available eventually the you have the level shifter is in the undefined state so the same thing happens to this circuit this is high voltage level shifter this is a v2i converter either you can turn off the current completely or turn on quite a high current in the v2i converter and the level shifters have caused us immense problems just because the supply sequence is different from different oems so some people do a very slow ramp on the battery so that means each supplies uh, come either very quickly or they come very late so some of the slow ramp scenarios have created more problems because of the level shifters go in the undefined states so this is a good example so here if this is battery on the low side and if we exceed the vt because of such a scenario eventually the current is going through the level low side fet and eventually you will deploy the airbag when it is powering up and that is not good so basically you need a level shifter that is uh, independent of a low voltage supply because that is the digital signal that comes through a low voltage supply it then makes a level shifting and then gives you the signal but we have to generate level shifters that are independent of the low voltage rail so several things have been reported so what we have used is basically you know so let's have two currents a high voltage supply generating a startup current and from the medium voltage supply the 5 volt supply you generate an accurate reference current and you have a voltage selector to pick up which voltage drives the sub current selector and at the startup you have a current that is inaccurate maybe 2 microamps so at, uh, once the 5 volt supply is available the band gap is available and you generate the reference current that gives you 10 microamp and basically this is your voltage selector formed by a combination of diodes with a voltage limiter so you get around 5 volts or 4.5 volts based on the rails and this selector circuit gives you the maximum current and then you can do your level shifters through your common source source amplifiers very simple circuit textbook circuits and you can use it in order to improve the reliability and the same thing for high voltage to control the pmos so from cross coupled level shifters we are trying to move towards the common source based approach to improve the reliability on safety devices okay so this is the simulation so you can see how do you simulate this you have a high voltage rail and suddenly you can pull the high voltage rail low because of all the faults that are involved and you have to make sure that you are when you are turning on the low side driver the low side driver should be able to provide you 3 amp of current only if all the supplies are available so out outside the boundaries you should have zero current that is the target and exactly it worked that way so this is the test setup so we have the silicon proving our uh, concept okay so with this i will go to some of the interesting things on the diagnostics so the diagnostics uh, you know is where the customers also test with negative voltages so then you have the influence of the npns and parasit pnp parasitics okay so the goal in diagnostics in every car is basically it's measuring the voltage measuring the leakage measuring the impedance on a certain pin and it is checking for the power fets occasionally just to make sure they are intact before a deployment event so all these outputs whatever you monitor are provided to the microcontroller through an analog output some devices integrate the adc and then they are reported by software directly so the fets are always turned on with a certain low current because we talked about high current during the main event but for diagnostics we use a much much smaller current of 10 milliamps to 30 milliamps to check for leakage okay so in the diagnostic scheme in a airbag driver so you have to the goal is this point output goes to the microcontroller or to an adc 
and this is the buffer basically it buffers the voltage and you have a set of switches the spike command activates the switches so all are activated one by one to check for different inputs so the input can go anywhere between 100 millivolt to 15 or even 30 mill 30 volts i'm sorry and then the output voltage has to be limited to 5.4 so when that happens so the first thing to you do for the high voltage is basically limit the limit the input at the OTA. So if you have to limit the output voltage of the OTA, you have to, the better way is to limit the input of the OTA. So if you have 30 volt here, you basically divide it down and then provide it to the OTA output and then this goes to the ADC or the microcontroller. So we have to have 5.4 volt plus minus 100 volt millivolt conditions because the micros don't tolerate 6 volts if you put a zener for example. Okay, so let me talk about the switches because the switches are the essential part of a diagnostic scheme. So we have to really make sure they are working within the electrical SOA. So if your input is at 30 volt and you can drive the gate by 5 volts because that is the VGS you need, the 30 volt is going to come over. However, the main problem we see is basically if this is at 30 volt, you are going to damage your GS2 switch, the S2 switch because you are exceeding your 5.5 or 12 volt and you have a negative VGS that can immensely, immensely right away it can pop up the oxide and that's the problem we see if we don't take preventive measures in the design. Okay, so what about LDMOS? Because one of the things is source to bulk can be tied together. So people started to use LDMOS based switches but there is a different problem with the LDMOS because when you have 30 volt here, you are going to forward bias this diode and it is going to charge the neighboring input. So if one input 1 raises to 30 volt, the input 2 comes towards 27 volt just because it is seeing the diode through the other switch. So to avoid that, people we have to use back to back switches and protect. That means this is like a dynamic switch which is basically the gate voltage is tracking the so input voltage. And this is proven to be more robust, it is protecting all the junctions. And if you, you have two versions of this. So one is the LDMOS based version or the NMOS based version and there is also a PMOS based version which we can see quickly. So what we do, so you have a back to back switch. So you take the input, based on the input you know the gate voltage is biased. So this node, once the bias current comes up when the switch is on, this voltage starts to rise. So the source starts to rise and basically you have a overdrive and then you limit the voltage. So eventually what we are talking about is a VIN plus two VGS or, or a single VGS is good enough. If it is a PMOS, things are easy, but it's bigger in area. You have back to back, you put a resistor to keep it off and then take the bias current down and then eventually you bias it. When it is off, the resistor makes sure the VGS is zero. So it eliminates all the problems related to the body diodes conducting and all those. So this is a very commonly used high voltage NMOS. This is a high voltage PMOS based to protect uh, the diagnostic circuits. need to wait, it looks like it's updating the slides. Okay, good. So in the LDMOS base, base switches, we are seeing one problem, especially, so when you have an NMOS and this is at 30 volt, so let's say this is a LDMOS with, a, with the drain that is seeing the pad, and if it goes to minus two volt, if it is a very big power fed, it can handle that current that flows into the pin of minus 2 volt. But if those pins are not, if those structures are not placed far away or at a certain distance, then what can happen is within the chip, you can get a NPN conduction. Your substrate is at ground. So this is one end junction. This is another end junction. So you could potentially conduct an NPN transistor. You can, NPN transistor is already there in the chip. Now the question is whether you activate it or not depends on how you how it is laid out. So the distance of separation between these two drains decides whether or basically will tell you whether an NPN is conducting here or not. So instead of the current going into this path, every current will go from the bias current into this output pin of minus 2 volt. So eventually you will get nothing on your diagnostics. So this 
so there are some layout techniques that that help you or design techniques so one thing is if you have a high ohmic switch so that means your switch is not very big so if you are instead of using a 9r r type of resistor you can bring all this 9r the resistors in front of the pad so even when this pad goes to minus 2 volt the, the body diode is here the current is limited by your resistor which is in the order of 100 kilo ohms so this eventually eliminates a potential npn stealing the current between the two pads the other option is from a layout standpoint so this is the npn that we are talking about so you have the switch 1 and switch 2 so the switch 1 let's say is 1 volt and the other switch is pulled down to minus 0.7 you create a npn between these two drains so the current instead of going into this transistor starts to flow into this parasitic path and the victim and the aggressor are that the aggressor starts you know this transistor switch s1 becomes the victim so to avoid that nowadays people have the process the deep trench process which eliminates or reduces the parasitic npn conduction or the old traditional technology is to basically use a, a guard ring so basically there is a n guard ring to ground so when this pin is pulled negative so you are protecting the victim so basically this doesn't become a victim ideally all the current starts to go from ground back into this uh, pad that is at minus 0.7 so guard ring techniques or a deep trench is good enough to eliminate this npns completely and uh, have the diagnostics running without fail so the next slide is what we do for the high side switch so in the high side fits i mean basically idea is to turn on the switch and see if the source voltage comes up and then you have a comparator to say there is a leak to high voltage or leak to battery so that's typically the way how you check the fit if the fit is completely broken you will not see the flag getting set and that's the diagnostic that keeps running uh, you know 1 to 2 millisecond every at every ignition cycle every time you turn on the car you will be basically this is what will happen so in the power stage in the airbag control unit so the low side fit is basically powered through a current source and then you are trying to pull the drain of the low side to ground and check check for a leak to ground so if the fit is broken there won't be leak to ground or if there is a leak to battery at that node it will get flagged so that's basically how the diagnostics are running on those fits okay so so as i told you i mean we need to have a, a, a current 5.4 volt limitation or even sometimes it's 3.3 these days with a very good tolerance because the microcontrollers cannot handle a little bit even to a, like a 4 volt on a 3.4 volt level range so more over voltage protection is needed at the output and we are trying to do that by clamping the input and uh, a simple technique where as long as the input is less than 5.4 those inputs are multiplex you know you have a multiplexer so you have a clamp voltage so whenever the input is lower so pretty much those are all passed to the OTA and the output stays less than 5.4 if you have if your input is exceeding 5.4 volt your clamp voltage is set to 5.4 and that is maxed out and then basically you are limiting the voltage at the micro to 5.4 so it's going to the next slide okay so here is the silicon result you can see my input has gone from 100 millivolt to 25 volt and then basically your output is limited from 100 millivolt to 5.4 volt so as long as the input is less than 5.4 it is passed the moment it goes higher than 5.4 it is clamped and the precision is really good you are able to achieve within 100 millivolt and this is the silicon data that we have and here is basically you have to do it for the falling edge as well as the rising edge just to make sure that there are no stability issues that you run into because of this kind of clamping okay so with that i have like 15 more slides i think i can wrap it up in the next 15 minutes so let me give you a summary of the overhead in the automotive design so if you look into all the topologies for the automotive designs right they are not way different from what you see in the textbooks or what you have in your conventional consumer applications pretty much standard structures are applied but you have to go and add a few more tricks tricks like the feed forward or the unpowered state requirements those you get in the automotive design they make it slightly complicated or you have to 
that is an additional overhead it's an, it's not a fancy circuit it's a simple circuit but it creates an additional overhead and additional area that you need to add on to your main driver stage the 40 volt compliance on is mandatory on several high voltage pins as a, as i told you 75% of the pins are high voltage so esd is a requirement because you have powered esd unpowered esd so when i mean at the ic level what we run today is the standard hbm and the cdm tests but there are also powered esd so that means the part is powered and the customers will inject basically high voltage energy pulses to see what is the behavior and that is due to all the electrostatic discharge that can happen in the car due to the car seat you know there's a lot of foam that can generate discharge onto the ic's so pre pretty much the powered state esd requirement is relatively a strong requirement in the automotive designs and that can sometimes be a big overhead you have to really do additional circuits to withstand or you have to have special esd structures to withstand those energies so then you have something called as the dpi or, or the radio frequency immunity so there is noise coming in high frequency noise coming into your control units from bulk current injection or mobile trans somebody you know if you have a mobile phone on it can pick up the circuits can pick up the noise and you have to design circuits that are really immune to this kind of uh, noise so they cannot you cannot destroy the part reset is sometimes allowed a safe state is allowed but the main thing is to avoid the destruction of the chip due to this kind of uh high energy pulses so if you look as i told you the hbm standard is 1 plus minus 1 kb this is the traditional for every air chip cdm 500 volt so in the automotive world there is a standard called aec q100 the automotive electronics council so they are specify plus minus 2 kb for hbm so 500 volt for cdm and the corner pins need to withstand 750 volts so there is an 8 kb requirement unpowered and powered for the the squib pins the zx and zmx the output of the high side and low side drivers and you can use only capacitors for some limited energy but we have to have 25 kv okay they allow zener diodes to be put in those places the outputs so no destruction of the asic or the part cannot reset so this is a kind of requirement that we see too okay and uh, coming to this conducted emission levels okay this is very important this is what also we had a talk in the morning from yogesh any fast switching on a converter or a charge pump should be avoided so you don't want to switch up in a few nanoseconds you instead of 10 or 15 is a reasonable one and the reason for it is let's say you have a sensor you have a charge pump that is driving a gate and it introduce and both have the same input supply so what's happening is this fast switching creates lot of noise so if you have a sync pulse to uh, activate a sensor you could simply do a pulse this would do the job but you have very very sharp edge what happens is this creates lot of ldi by dt because every package that we have as a bond wire so not all our ball grid arrays where the inductance is low but most of the applications go with the standard bond wire package so you have ldi by dt due to the 3 nano henry inductance that you see on the bond wires so these generate lot of noise on the supply when the supply pick up lot of noise so you might have a band gap you might have your sensor circuits reacting to those noise so in frequency domain it looks like this because you don't want to have the emission in this frequencies you want to have them below a certain level for ic designers in terms of transient it's the power supply rejection noise and this peak voltages that we see can be in the order of plus minus 5 volts based on your ldi by dt and we have to avoid fast switching as much as possible and for that so for example in this application so you need to have a much more shaped pulse in order to generate uh, you know in order to reduce the emission so this is basically from a noise standpoint the most robust and and safe approach with this i will move to something about portability so we talked about high side low side drivers how do we design it across different technologies i mean i'm talking staying with lbc or a bi cmos process so the first up thing is you can pick up your device what you need if you want a 40 volt device make sure everything is electrically operating within its soa then make sure you can have your zener the breakdown so that means we have a 13.2 volt gate so your zener diode will also be 13.2 volts breakdown in the previous technology if you go to a new technology that has a 5 volt zener breakdown so your gate oxides typically are supporting only 5 volts not more up then 
basically for your power fed you go through the same process so make sure your thermal soa is is uh, ensured so you can scale down your feds but sometimes you have to make sure you cannot scale it down too much because of the thermal restrictions so you have to go through the flow therm simulations make sure it's all working fine and coming to the portability is interesting because so if you look into a transfer function like this i'll come to the slides the 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 circuit is shown in the next slide so you can simply scale you can make your transistor small because in the new technologies the oxide goes up by c ox goes by a factor of 2 if you scale it down by a factor of 2 the w over l your transconductance is the same so across technologies you can port circuits in such a way that the bode plot can remain the same the transient behaviors can remain the same so for that i am going to give you an example this is called the current limited voltage source if you look into this stage all it does is basically a voltage regulation so this is a typical ldo and on top of that you have a loop but you can also do a simple current mirror but if you have enough headroom so all this do the job so the voltage at the pin here is one the gain times the input voltage the source the regulated current that comes out of the pin during a fault is set by the ratio of the two resistors time reference and basically what you monitor for leakage is basically uh, you know you are making a copy of this and providing the load current information into this resistor so this is how exactly the impedance is measured with this circuit and if you go a little bit more into the details let's see so the diagnostics is always a two point measurement no customer simply measures impedance or the leakages with a single current they always use two currents and we and basic we want to make sure they are scalable I'll, i'll show you in a minute so this is how they have programmable current sources in one case you put a load current of 10 milliamp in another case you put a load current of 40 milliamp make sure the reported value on voltage is giving the scalar scaled value so this so the i source by k is basically the known current and all you do is you know the voltage that is measured through the amx out you can measure the voltage from this uh, from this resistor and in terms of current and you this is how the impedance is measured so coming to the scalability aspect what i want to show you is we have two loops here one is the voltage loop and the other is the current loop so when you do the small signal analysis and when you scale the switches based on your currents if your transfer function looks like this eventually you can scale everything so your gm goes up and then your your oxide changes or your drain current changes based on the technology and your w over l if you scale it down so you get yes a design that is portable but now it is also scalable so the gm for one current the i sync 1 is same as the gm for i sync 2 and you can see pretty much all your poles and zero the unity gain bandwidth everything remains the same so if you have multiple current sources all you need to do is make the scalability work such that your bode plot remains the same because different oems have different current requirements so you design it for 10 and 20 milliamp if your customer comes and asks whether it will work for 10 and 40 milliamp you can tell them without going and resimulating saying that hey this will work because you can see the show the equations and how the scalability works so that is the idea and because of too much combination and simulations you know so you don't want to i mean you can spend a lot of time simulating it but it's also good to have some predictability of the behavior for any input current and that is why we follow started to follow this particular scalability approach so one portability is also met and you can also have a scalability so this is the scalability for the current loop and if you look into the bode plot you can clearly see for both the currents my bode plot remains the same so this is for the current loop this is for the voltage loop and you can see when the current is in the transient also pretty much the behavior is the same and the loop regulates and this is the off state and this is the discharge of the current based on the capacitance and uh, so this is this will change but when you see when it regulates you can see the the rising edge uh, for both the currents are pretty much the same so here is the silicon result so you can clearly see okay so it goes up and then okay the depends on which current we have used here 36 and 4 milliamp and you can see pretty much the behavior is tracking for both the currents and this is this is the off state of the loop because the loop is cutting off and then trying to regulate and when it when it once it regulates you can see pretty much the ideal uh, regul i mean for both the currents it remains the same so the same here 
but this is the discharge so it's only the I over C that determines the discharge so we don't need to be concerned here. So the circuits definitely can be scalable and made more predictable if we just use and then you can prove it by equations that the Bode plot remains the same and it also matches your transient simulations. Okay. So conclusion. So automotive designs you know are not very different from conventional IC design. So they pretty much, you can go to your textbook and take the circuit and then start to design. And most of the IC, the challenges we have are basically the 40 volt requirement. And when some pins have the minus two volt or minus 18 volt, it forces you to take some different path that you don't see in textbooks or in, a, in some of the publications. So these are not broadly publicized yet. So the designs definitely can be portable from one technology to the other. Circuits that are scalable have better predictable behavior because different OEMs, different input currents, you don't need to be running several thousands of simulations. All you can make sure is if you have a set of equations with paper and pen, you can prove that you can, your, your scalability and predictability will work. You can give the answer right away to your customer that no matter what your input current is, you can, be, you can support the functionality. Then additional circuit modifications might be needed to address the fault conditions, the ESD and DPI requirements, the unpowered states, the in spec specification immunity. Those are kind of additional burden to the designers that typically don't uh, occur in consumer environment or any other uh, conventional IC design. So most of the problems in our automotive designs come from level shifters. So if you see a line down, the fundamental problem will go to the level shifters just because the customer has swapped the power supply sequence or something. So those level shifters can be made fail silent by choosing the topologies and these topologies are very simple, common source level shifters. And diagnostic and cross-link tests will be very critical and should be avoided or should be designed to avoid any false warnings. I mean, the, the main trick is if you have a comparator, you know the inputs, the comparator gives you the right output. But what we also want to make sure is comparator not giving the false output and confusing the driver or the passenger. And that's the main thing we have to take care. And quality is a key factor. So the zero DPPM is the expectation, but typically we achieve around one to, do, one to two DPPM. Okay, with that, I go to the references. So here are a set of references, you know, that are available, but you will see most of them, you don't see it in the papers. It's all application manuals or some kind of, uh, you know, for example, an auto leap screwdriver validation provided by Vince Colarazzi. So these are the materials we have to go and find out from different automotive conferences and some data sheets. And with that, I really thank you for your attention. It's a long slide, a set of slides, but I really appreciate your patience. Thank you. Let me try to go back. Okay, the question is, the typical junction temperature is specified to be 150 degrees. So here we are talking about 200 or even higher. Is that a concern? It's a very valid question because this is the question we also get from our customers. So when, so the history, let me say a little bit on the history of this. So when, uh, when more and more gate drivers were getting integrated. So when, and people were trying to size up the FETs for 150 degrees junction temperature. So that means within the FET, the junction temperature needs to be around 150. The FET size was simply big. So in 2002, uh, 2004 timeframe, people start, the technologists started to explore what is limiting. Why should we specify 150 degrees? Historically, the one was basically all the models at the time were limited to 150. But then the technologists found out the devices can do more than that. The devices can even handle more. And that's exactly when they explored, they came up with something called the critical temperature that the FET can handle based on your VDS and the current. It's basically a power dissipation. 
and then they tried to formulate equations. They they did lot of tests. You know, they had lot of tests over several uh, wafers, several dyes, and then they figured out the temperature can they can that fats can handle can go up to 400. 400 for DC conditions or even up to 550. It depends on the supplier as well, the semiconductor technology. So for TI technologies, for these kind of deployment pulses, in all LBC technologies in TI or the BCD technologies, we see that they handle about 550 degrees. So, so this was not done 20 years ago, but, but around 2004, 2005 time frame, several companies, Infineon also had papers on this. They proved that the temperatures can go up to 500 and the device can survive. So that's basically an experiment because we don't want to oversize the fit and that's exactly the motivation. Especially when you integrate more and more, you want to be cost effective. And how to avoid oversizing the FET was exactly the uh, background behind this work. And they have proven that you can handle up to 400 or even 550 degrees without destruction. Meaning you do the deployment pulse once, after a certain cooling time you do it again, you do million cycles, there is no degradation in the performance of the FET. And that's how exactly it got proven. I have one question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you simply double the area of the transistor, or double the size of the transistor to accommodate for that uh, 400 degree operation. Yeah. Was that simply enough? I, I would have thought uh, maybe uh, current degradation will be even more than Oh, uh, yeah. So, so what, what happened is, is so in that junction, so that's a source for the way. Eventually, that output stage is biased with maybe 50 or 60 micrograms. But then, uh, okay, let, let me see if I can go to the slide. So the question is, uh, in this slide, yeah. So the question is, in this slide, the transistor MF, we have to oversize it or over design it because we are entering an un un unknown area or a gray area that is not simulatable. Typically, what we have seen is, at high temperatures, the leakage in this node is high. But IG, the current that we use to drive the final stage, that current is in the order of 100 microamps. So instead of MF, the source follower driving just 100 microamps, make it 2x, so it can drive 200 microamps, so that even in that, when the junction temperature rises up to 300 or 400 degrees, the trans the source follower can still operate. And that we have proved that it can do that, yeah. So if you just design it for IG, you know, it might go, you know, it can be, you might not have enough margin, the current might start to droop. But if you over design it, just that stage, it's a small transistor. So adding a little bit more in the area doesn't grow the, grow the size that much. So we can, we can say that it can still operate at such high temperatures, even though you're not able to simulate it. How many deployments does the supercluster provide? Okay, so from the tier, okay, the question is how many deployments the circuit has to survive. So the AECQ100 standard for the automotive specifies about a million cycles. So typically the semiconductor vendors do that. But in the real application, it's up to 10 pulses or 100 pulses because it's also in reality, I mean, the main reason is you want to reuse the airbag control unit as much as possible. You, you change the bag, but keep the same ACU. So that happens maybe 10 times roughly. So the question is, is there any aging uh, aspect that can make the circuits unstable? Yeah, so we do also take care. I mean, one of the reasons that circuit typically doesn't go unstable, but what happens is we do see degradation due to temperature dependent phenomena and the biasing conditions like NBTI and PBTI. But we do make sure, we do have aging models that uh, the semiconductor suppliers do offer these days 
and then we make sure that we are covered in those aspects. So yes, it does happen, but we can mitigate it. Okay, so the question is about the modeling for this high voltage devices. So these kind of drivers are basically, um, you know, not uh, not uh, regular PWMs. So what happens is the the models relate to basically, uh, you know, the VGS. So so it's basically, uh, you know, you have the GM and everything. The standard spice model supply. So whatever we use for the low voltage circuits are also apply for the high voltage. So what is modeled, well modeled is basically the, uh, the, the drain source junctions. So we have to make sure that uh, the degradation, the, the hot carrier injection and everything is modeled well. So that means when you take a transistor from, let's say if it is operating at 25 volts, so one of, that is one of the deployment supplies. If I have to raise that voltage to 35 volt, I really need to know the, the hot carrier currents that could get, potentially get injected. You know, so that is, those kind of models need to be added which is also not different from the consumer stages, consumer applications. The CGS and CGD, they need to be modeled well. And apart from that, uh, so the amount, if, if impact of inductances is much less because you're already driving one micro Henry load. So the, induct, the inductances that are present within the source and drain are sometimes modeled, sometimes not. But yeah, so the basic requirements are getting your uh, hot carrier modulation, the GMs, and all those in the regular spice models is good enough. And these are characterized or given to the designers up to 200 degrees. That's basically how the technology works today for several industry companies. And for so in the gray area, you try to go through a DFMEA based approach and then decide what structures to put, what not to put. So I don't know if I answered your question, but so this is how the modeling typically works. Yeah. All right. Let's say our speaker, Thank you.